to call on my um, friend and colleague, Ben Lawrence. Ben is a medical oncologist at Auckland Hospital. He's recently been appointed head of the discipline of oncology at the University of Auckland. He co-directs a large um, clinical genomics program and he chairs Auckland's Molecular Tumor Board. Kia ora, Ben. Well, kia ora, Chris, and um, kia ora, Irene. Thank you for that uh, fantastic talk, and I feel very humbled uh, talking after you. Um, for everybody on the call, I'm a clinician, um, and I'm going to um, keep this pretty simple, um, and it's probably going to be the most lowbrow talk of the day, because I want to focus on what's actually happening in the clinic now, um, as opposed to some of the really cool things that are coming down the pipeline in the future that will be the focus of the day. Um, I'm also feeling, um, I, I don't know if you can see me online, but I'm in clinic and I've just, uh, a 37 year old guy has just stepped out, um, was the patient I saw just before this meeting, who's um, unfortunately two weeks ago found out that his cancer has come back, his bowel cancer, um, and we don't, we can't cure it. So the, uh, the things that I'm going to talk about are, are in my mind when I think about this young man with his two kids and not too much option ahead of him. So, um, oh, I'm just trying to uh, advance the slides. Oh, here we go. So the questions I'm going to focus on are, do we use genomics in the everyday cancer clinic, so day to day, and should we use genomics in the everyday cancer clinic, focusing on the former? Um, so focusing on um, this, um, the answer, and you know, spoiler alert is yes, we do. Um, but on the other hand, no, not really, um, slightly. I hope that makes sense in a moment. So just going back a step, just thinking about the treatment of bowel cancer, especially if you're a scientist, surgery's been around for a couple of hundred years. And the really cool thing happened in surgery in the 1890s and late 1800s when anesthesia came along. And that's the little guy on the right there in that photo with his high tech handkerchief holding the chloroform, which meant that surgery didn't hurt. Radiotherapy came along about the 1890s as well, but in the 50s, linear accelerators were invented, and you can see this really terrifying picture actually of this massive technology and this wee baby who was treated with um, radiotherapy to the brain tumor. Chemotherapy came along accidentally in the late 50s after uh, an accident in the 40s when nitrogen mustard gas was spread across Bari Harbor in the war, and it shrank lymph nodes uh, and was used for lymphoma uh, in the 50s. Targeted therapy has been around for a couple of decades, um, starting off with, I guess, the poster child being imatinib, uh, but now with a raft of other options. Uh, and um, immunotherapy, particularly in the last half of the last decade. So this is our, I guess, our buffet of options uh, for anyone with cancer. And if we think about the question is, is genomics used for making the decisions around these treatments? And if we, th I guess it's not too much of a surprise to think, um, if we think about colorectal cancer, that targeted therapy, we would use genomic tests. And in the everyday clinic, we use BRAF to guide the use of BRAF inhibitors. Uh, and we use the two RAS, these two RAS genes, two of the RAS genes, to choose to that, which need to be wild type if cetuximab, an EGFR inhibitor, is going to be effective. So we use genomics or multi-gene testing for um, cho the choice of targeted therapy won't be a surprise to you that we also use it for immune, immune therapy. We use the, uh, the, the um, a mutation in one of the mismatch repair genes, the top four there, which can either be tested directly or by looking at MSI status, microstat inst instability and inferring that. We can also look at tumor mutational burden, which tends to occur in many of these patients, but sometimes for other reasons as well. So what about chemotherapy? Yep, we use, chemo we use uh, multi-gene testing for chemotherapy choice. Patients with uh, the first four, the mismatch repair genes, don't tend to have as much shrinkage with chemotherapy. So when shrinkage is important, we um, tend to give more drugs rather than less. If there's a BRAF mutation, those are bad players. And so we tend to offer three drugs instead of two. And of course, MSI status, as before, can be another way of measuring the mismatch repair genes. What about surgery? Yep, we even use um, uh, gene testing for surgery in bowel cancer because if the patient has a mutation in a mismatch repair gene, this could be a germline mutation that Irene spoke so um, eloquently about. Um, and we may conduct a larger operation uh, as, a as a preventative technique, or we may interpret the findings of low grade lesions as being more concerning and conduct a more extensive resection. Radiotherapy is probably the least likely to use genomics, but in fact, we do at the moment. If you've got a rectal cancer, which is quite bulky, sometimes we give chemotherapy first to shrink that down. 
but we, and we know that if the tumour is deficient in one of these mismatch repair genes, so it's mutated, um, then we would um, expect the chemo to do less well. However, the effect of radiotherapy is preserved in that setting, so we would favour radiotherapy. So looking at all of this, the, um, all parts of our cancer treatment currently have some sort of multi-gene testing and it, it guides our therapy and at a really basic level. So one approach to this would be a, um, uh, you know, a multi-gene test, a genomic test. Um, however, in our hospital, and I think in all of yours, um, it's, uh, we, our, there's, there is a, uh, a combination that's worked out to try and get around the cost and time taken for a multi-gene test at the moment. And in our hospital, we, inf we test the protein, the presence or absence of the protein using immunohistochemistry, super old school, cheap and fast. And that's the, the priority for the hospital, focusing on the cheap. Um, and so we do, um, uh, so the, the absence of one of the four mismatch repair genes is assumed to mean a, um, a mutation. Uh, and the presence of a BRAF V600 protein, so positive staining in this case, is presumed to indicate the mutation, the presence of a mutation in BRAF. Even more, MSI status, is, which is, is inferred as being positive um, if there's a, one of these mismatch repair gene mutations, and as is tumor mutational burden. Of course, that doesn't actually pick up all cases where this would be the case, but um, there's a comfort with the cost offset that we are prepared to, unfortunately, to accept a bit of error. And so all that really leaves is the two RAS genes, KRAS and NRAS, um, as those that require a multi-gene uh, assay. And because it's only a couple and they've got hot spots, our hospital tends to just use a simple small mass array panel. So do we use genomics in the everyday cancer clinic? Yes, we do. And that is insofar as mutations are used for treatment decisions. But no, we don't. And that we don't really do true you know, genomic testing as a scientist might think of as a panel or an exome uh, or a whole genome. But that's where we're up to. So next question, should we use genomics in the everyday cancer clinic? And just really quickly, and I guess thinking about this um, with my patient that I've just seen, he's a young guy, he's got no savings. Um, he's got two wee kids. He's conscious of the fact that he, in a year or two, um, he will be leaving his family. Um, and he's also conscious that he wants to maximize the time with his families and see his kids grow up for as long as possible. But it's a really tough trade off that financial decision. Um, and the answer to this, I think, is probably yes, we should use it, but no, we shouldn't in one respect, uh, well, in some respects. We think about my, ch my chap, he's got chemotherapy, targeted therapy and immune therapy on the, on the, on the options, depending on the results of multi-gene testing. If we think about the treatments that are funded in Australia and New Zealand, surgery, radiotherapy, chemotherapy, and in Australia, EGFR monoclonals, but not BRAF combinations, as far as I believe, for colon cancer. Um, but in both countries, immune therapy is not funded for bowel cancer yet, I, I believe, um, and targeted, no targeted therapies are funded in New Zealand. And so the fact that of this is that as soon as I conduct a multi-gene testing, a multi-gene test on anybody, if it results in the inability of some parts of our community to not be able to pay for it or afford it, we've instantly created an inequity. And this is a discussion that I've had with this guy. Do you want to know or not? Um, he wants to know and he, I don't know how, is going to, if, if his, he has a favorable molecular profile, he believes he can get together some money for these things, but it's an enormous, bigly big decision for him and his wife, who at this stage are still struggling with the idea of such a short time ahead of him and a young guy, um, uh, and wanting to do everything they can. But really, you know, as time goes on, they get, he's, they're gonna make the tough decisions about whether, what the right thing to do is. So should we use genomics in the clinic? Well, yeah, it helps us to use funded therapies, also unfunded therapies, but no in terms of what we're gonna be doing in terms of inequity unless we can create a situation where the drugs that are indicated are available to everybody equally, which is an ongoing work in progress. So in summary, do we use genomics in everyday clinic? Yep, we do, but kind of we don't. Um, do we use genomics? Should we use genomics? I think we should, but we have to be extremely careful and be aware of the potential for harm. So the, my title was uh, 
giant mix in everyday cancer care coming really or not? Well, actually it's coming and it's probably here um, and we need to find uh, really effective ways of dealing with the technical as um, parts of this uh, dilemma, but also the very human, personal, Fano and um, and um, community side of this as well. Thanks.